What's up, guys? Welcome to Run It Back. I'm Charlie Dolgenis, and I'll be hosting this episode. Today, our guest is Max Rappaport, a former Sixers beat writer. He got his start working for the Eagles, then went to the Sixers when new ownership took over. Run it back. Could you kind of walk me through what uh, the beat writer does? Because, I mean, obviously, like, you write recaps of games and stuff, but I think people don't quite realize how much you do. Yeah, so, so my role with the Sixers, like, I guess kind of, like, speaking to that, that part about um, it being a really different topic than that. And, like, now almost every team, uh, pretty much every team, the Sixers included, like, have much bigger, like, content staff. They have, like, full video departments. They have um, a lot of times, like, multiple writers or multiple, multiple social media people. Um, at the time, it was really just those couple people who um, were there more, like, on the IT side of the website, honestly. Um, <laughs> like, just, like, making sure it worked. Yeah. Um, and then there was me and a social media coordinator who came in. So really, like, in the beginning, especially, um, kind of just had to be, like, a jack-of-all-trades, um, which I think was one of the other things that really helped um, help me get the job, was I had some video experience. Um, I had, as I what a lot of, honestly, what a lot of um, B-writers and, and people doing content in sports kind of have, and newspapers and whatever, kind of have to do now is, like, know how to do a lot of different things and mm-hmm. um, be on camera So it's it's funny that you say that like the the Instagram account didn't exist and like the Twitter was run by the public relations manager in like the last like five ten years I guess kind of since two thousand eleven teams have kind of started hiring people who like young people who are very familiar with how social media actually works to run their Twitter and I I kind of feel like you may have been partially responsible for that because. You know, the Sixers were so bad at that time, but then our, like, the sports social media was consistently highlighted as innovative, and it kind of changed the way NBA teams engage with their audience. So, like, how did you decide to start, like, posting memes and, like, troll people online from the official verified account? Yeah, so it was it was a real process. So, like, I, I wouldn't say... Pun intended. I take too much credit for it because I think there were a lot of teams who really were on the vanguard of that like one that comes to mind is um, the LA Kings were one of the first ones really to do that to like give their their Twitter account a voice Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time a lot of people really loved it and I think a lot of more traditional people especially in the industry were like what is this like the team shouldn't be like you know clapping back at people online it shouldn't be like making even, even like um, just having having a personality, even if it's not um, as aggressive or, or making fun of things or you know jumping in on with memes and stuff, just it being more conversational or, or less um, less serious. I think a, a lot of the trouble for us was convincing for me, yeah, because I was there for a while, was like convincing people that that made sense. 
this and that was the way to do it. Because I think for a long time, um, social media early on was was seen from these teams as like an extension of every other bit of marketing material a team would put out. So there was kind of a misunderstanding, I feel like, in the beginning about what the culture of uh, these different platforms was. And there was a thought that you could just take what would go into a marketing pamphlet or into a television ad or, you know, anything else mm-hmm. and, and just, like, apply it to online. And it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, so I think it was a lot of, like, honestly, it was just a lot of convincing, right? And a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like, um, pushing the limits a little bit here and there and when it worked trying to highlight that and, and, and show people who were doubtful about the idea of the account being more conversational like hey this works people actually like this yeah. um, I think one of the times that there was um, that comes to mind I think was um, and, and now looking back it's silly because I feel like every team does this like every day now oh, but, yeah. um, there's a time in summer league I guess it must have been 2014 um, or maybe 2013. It was, I think it was actually 2013. It was um, after the Sixers drafted their own Noel. Um, us and the Suns got into sort of like a back and forth on Twitter during Summer League. And um, uh, basically, like some fresh, it was after they drafted Noel, and there were some like fresh prints gifts, I think, that we used. Uh, and looking back, it's silly because it's like, like I said, like every team does that all the time now. It was like pretty tame, but I remember like it got written up about in like SB Nation and I think like ESPN actually highlighted it on their website at one point. Um, just because like teams aren't really doing that a ton. There were some teams like the Kings, like uh, the LA Kings, that is, like the, the Blazers actually are a team that for a long time was like, um, and, and still are really good on Twitter, but we're like more conversational, more silly, yeah. uh, tongue in cheek and stuff and sarcastic. Uh, but it was really at the time like not teams weren't really doing that a lot. Um, so even small things like that would get highlighted. People were like, "Whoa, the the account actually like speaks like a person or is yeah. posting things that like a fan would post." Um, and I was able like I think that actually really helped like getting that that positive uh, having that that interaction blow up on the thing that got written about was saying that like could, could like bring an ESPN screenshot of the, of the homepage to you know, whoever in the organization, but hey, look, people like this. Yeah. And that was kind of when it started. We got a little bit more uh, wiggle room to, to do stuff like that, and I think it just from there, we got a lot of good reaction to it. And, um, it was always a push and pull, though, because, like, uh, you know, it's like you were allowed to do stuff up until somebody didn't like it, and then and then you weren't allowed to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so that. So it was like this constant push and pull of, like, yeah, do stuff like get us out there, fans like it, and then if you did anything that, uh, you know, somebody within the organization saw and was like, why did we do this? You'd like, never do that again, would be kind of the message you'd get. <laughs> Is there anything you can think of where people from the organization were like, yeah, don't do that one, don't do that again? Uh, yeah, the, one of, this is, I, I, looking back, I think I stepped over the line with this one. Um, <laughs> but I, it probably is one of my favorite things that we ever did on social media for the Sixers. Um, it was, I think the 2014 season. Um, so it was when the Sixers were really, really bad. And um, it was uh, Carl, um, when he was coaching the, uh, the Kings, um, okay. He had, like, come on midway through the season as their head coach. Like, they fired, I forget who their coach was at the time, but fired them, hired George Carl. And before that, George Carl had been on ESPN as an analyst and had said something on the lines of, like, the Sixers are, you know, like, at least two years away from even fielding a respectable NBA roster. They're a joke and a disgrace and whatever. Um, and then he goes on to coach the Kings, and the Sixers play the Kings, you know, a few weeks after he's hired and beat them by, like, 30 points. Um, so on the Snapchat, which I think, I think, uh, we, we started Snapchat that year, I think. And it was kind of like the testing ground for me. <laughs> to just do, like, I think I see where this I is going. Nobody, I knew nobody was really looking at it. Like nobody from the team was really looking at it and it, and it goes away. There's not really like a way for it to get dug up later. Um, on the stories. So like <laughs> I did, we posted like it was, um, just the full quote, like, written out uh, with his name at the bottom, with, like, George Carl's name at the bottom, and then the final score, and then Energy by Drake was playing under it. 
<laughs> and it was like the full quote of like the fixtures are a disgrace and whatever, whatever, and then just the final score. Uh, and we got like that got picked up in a few places, and that was definitely one where they were like, yeah, you can't like shit on an opposing coach, even though he deserved it. But uh, <laughs> that was that was definitely one where we stepped over the line. But I, I like that one. <laughs> That's funny. So, I mean, you mentioned it, and we all know it. The Sixers were just horrific uh, for, I think, most of the time you were working for them. Unfortunately, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Is there a specific moment or game where you were covering it and you were just like, my God, like, this is rock bottom? Uh, you know, there were a couple Clippers games that were like that. Like, the Clippers would always, it was like during the <laughs> like Lob, Lob City, City year. Yeah. They would just beat the Sixers by, like, 50 points every time. But there was one game, I'm trying to remember what year it was. Uh, I think I know the game you're talking about. So, yeah, the Clippers, I feel like that happened, like, every time they played the Clippers, (laughs) basically. But there was a game against the Mavs. I need to go back and look at what year it was. But I think it was 2014, um, where they, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 2014. They... We're down, I think it was like 79 to like 35 at halftime. <laughs> um, and that was actually, uh, speaking of that, another time when uh, people were not happy with what we posted. Um, <laughs> kind of when that would happen. So I, I, I was, at the time, the team's B writer and did other content for the site. And um, uh, Sandro Gasparro, I can spell his name for you if you want, was uh, the social media coordinator at the time. And he had just come on that season. And so he was doing most of the Twitter account. I was like, uh, I would travel. So I would like send stuff back or post, also post stuff. And then I was like the Snapchat person too. Mm-hmm. Um, and we would kind of share some some duties. But um, he would kind of just stop tweeting when it got really bad, which I think was probably the right move. Um, <laughs> nobody wants to hear like, no one's doing well with a you know, tough drive to the rim. He's got 12 points, Sixers down 43. And, yeah. you know, eight minutes left in the third. Um, so, like, he would just stop tweeting, but at halftime, you kind of have to, like, do something. Um, like, you gotta, you gotta give, like, a score update or something. So, he just posted a gif of Fredo from The Godfather, like, sighing (laughs) at at half, and we got in a lot of trouble for that. Although, I actually think that was, like, totally fine. I think, I I think there was a a misunderstanding a lot of the times. Probably what would, what would come up the most for us, the most frustrating thing is, like, the team was bad. Everyone knew they were bad. Anyone tuning in expected them to lose and knew they were tanking. And obviously, we can't say they're tanking, but like they're rebuilding. We're open about that part of it. Um, but that, like, they don't want. They don't, especially in Philly, like people don't want you to be like inauthentic with it, like pretending like it's not what it is. Yeah. So, like in that instance, it's like, yeah, they're down forty-five at half, and it's awful, and. It, like Tony Roden starting alongside like Hollis Thompson and Henry Sims. <laughs> like I think the Fredo sign gif is like fine, right? Yeah. Um, uh, there there wasn't much like there wasn't much uh, room for being self aware sometimes. Yeah. Like, that, I mean, there was sometimes, but I, people would. T- I'd say that was most often the thing people would get upset about was if there was any like uh, self awareness about the fact that like yeah, this is kind of rough. Yeah. Um, with all that said, who is there like one process player that you like really wish the Sixers kept? You know, I, I think if we're just talking about like basketball, like uh, Jeremy Grant would probably be like the most useful. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of like crazy that that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> you would think there'd be like somebody considering that really only do all be TJ McConnell or leftover. Yeah. That, like somebody in the league would be more more useful than that, but really, I think, like, Jeremy Grant or Earl is Noel. Mm-hmm. Um, probably Tony Rhodes is the one I, like, miss the most. Like, Tony Rhodes was, like, awesome. really fun when he was on the team. Um, but, but actually, like, helping, uh, who would actually, like, play a little bit, probably, probably Jeremy Grant. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. I think my version of Tony Roden in that is, like, Isaiah Cannon. <laughs> yeah. I just, like, I loved the whole cannonball thing because he was, like, a little bit fat. <laughs> like I liked that. <laughs> um, that was why I was, I was so dumb. They didn't get Carson Edwards. He's yeah, because like, of those a, a quads, man. Uh, as a cannon. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you mentioned that you traveled. Did, did you like travel with the team? I did. Yeah. Like you flew private. Yeah, so it was like on their charter, which as a twenty. 
at the time, like, 23-year-old. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, that must have been awesome. Um, do you get, like, the same sort of treatment as the players, or do you, like, have to sit, like, elsewhere? No, there was definitely, like, a, uh, a hierarchy, like mm-hmm. a first class, and we were in, like, whatever the equivalent of, like, the uh, the spot in the Titanic where all the, where they're, like, playing fiddles and, like, yeah. eating, eating rule. <laughs> I was, like, kind of... Although, although I, I don't want to go too far with it. Like, we were basically in the back of the, of the plane. Um, kind of the way it worked with the players would get seats in the front. Um, the middle area was coaches, and then the back area was, like, basically everyone else. So, like, uh, myself, there was a videographer who would sometimes travel with us, uh, PR people, the trainers, um, massage therapists, like, all those people were at the mm-hmm. back. And, like, uh, Mark Zumoff and, and, like, anyone who – those people would all travel with the team, too, like, any TV people. Mm-hmm. and radio people um but it was pretty awesome I, I have to say like that part of it was really cool it really like ruined me for any kind of other flying like yeah. you just probably the best part of it so there was like food on the plane that was really good which is a, a real perk um like they would bring stuff on um then so would be like uh you'd have like steaks or you'd have like lobster mac and cheese that we just like waiting for you and you got there. So it was like pretty amazing in that regard because you got whatever the players and coaches were getting too. Uh, but probably the best part of it was there was like no, I mean, there was security, but you didn't have to actually go through the airport. You basically just like pulled up on the tarmac. They would like wand you down and then you were like right on the plane and it was like 10 minutes later. Wow. Like, it was it was pretty spectacular in that sense. Yeah, that's sweet. Um. So, I mean, with you, like, spending so much time around the players, like, on flights, if you're traveling with the team, like, that sort of thing, did you have, like, friends that were players on the team? You know, it was, like, it was kind of frowned upon, and I, I think as, I think if I were doing this job now, I would have felt more comfortable um, kind of doing that, uh, but I think being so young and being, although I was around the same age as both the players, uh, especially because the team was so young. But I think, like, just being so new to it, growing up as the youngest one traveling, um, it was definitely, like, I was trying to not do anything that would stand out or, like, uh, get me in trouble or get me kicked off the yeah. trips or anything. <laughs> um, but there were definitely guys that I would, like, talk to more often. Like, you're, you know, you're on buses together, you're hanging, hanging around the same places, like, waiting for the plane, waiting for whatever. Um I feel like Hollis Thompson was someone who I talked to a lot. Um, I really liked him. He was like really down to earth. Um, Joel Embiid, I would say, wasn't someone I talked to so often. Um, but I think like he really was into the social media stuff, so like he would interact with that a lot more with like <laughs> DM uh, yeah. the account about something or like. Um, so it, he's probably the one who have like maintained the most contact with since, and it's pretty minimal. It's just like through DMs occasionally. But um, never really hung out or anything. I mean, that's awesome, uh, though. Yeah, and it, it, that part of it was really cool. Um, yeah, and I, th- I think uh, I think also because the team was so young, it was like you had more guys who didn't have a lot, who didn't have families, didn't have like we're in a new city and like we're more, I think, willing to just like talk to you on the bus. Whereas you know, if it was a, a more veteran team, like. I think, um, and it's not that, like, the older guys weren't, like, polite or anything, but they're, like, FaceTiming with their daughter. They're, like, doing yeah. other other stuff, you know, yeah. whereas, like, Tony Roden and Jakar Stanton or whatever are kind of just, like, hanging out yeah. and don't, don't have as much going on. That's funny. Um, so switching gears a little bit, I spent a decent amount of, uh, a decent amount of time today scrolling through your Twitter and your most famous tweet of the last year is the one where the uh, the announcer keeps screaming, No, senor, after Cody Parkey misses the double doink. Uh, <laughs> how, how did you find yeah. that clip? The Cody Parkey. 43 yardas. El snap. Le mete el pie. Distancia, dirección. Le dio el poste. No, falló. Oh. No, senor. No, senor. No, senor. No, senor. No, señor. No, señor. Los hijos se van con la victoria. Ay, papá. No, señor. No, señor. Chicago, Chicago. Nos vamos para New Orleans. 
Philadelphia gana el partido. Le dio el poste. I can't remember if I saw it on Reddit or like maybe it was on YouTube afterwards. I can't remember where I found that. Um, somebody posted it. I saw it posted somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised. I, I didn't realize that was my. That was having like the most retweeted tweet or something. Yeah, it's got like like. I think like 2,500 re- retweets or something like that. So one of the, also one of the articles I enjoyed uh, most of yours was like the, the full breakdown of like what's up with the Markel Fultz situation. And yeah. now, you know, six months later or whatever, after we've traded him, what do you, do you have any theories? I feel like I know less now than I've like ever felt like I know about it. Really? Like, I think I went through a bunch of different phases of like, okay, it's definitely just like this drastic outlet syndrome. Okay, no, it's definitely like the yips. I, I really at this point don't know. It's hard to imagine that it is not an, uh, you know, an injury, whether it's the drastic outlet syndrome or nerve damage or whatever it is, right? Like it, it's hard to imagine there's not something like very real. I don't really believe that like he got psyched out and it's in his head and now he can't, like, I, I, you know, he's, yeah. Um, not tough enough mentally. I don't really believe that. I don't like, think that's a thing. Um, <laughs> I think it can be for a little bit. I think players can like overthink things, but not to the point of like going two years not being able to shoot. Yeah. Um, and as someone who's like, I don't, ha- I've never had like his shoulder problem, but I've had like I've had issues with my shoulder, and like you know, just like go, like I've had times or issues with my shoulder where it's like that at that exact point where, you know, nothing really hurts. It's, it's, um, picking up stuff is fine. Opening doors is fine. But like just raising my hand straight up above my head. And this is my left arm, so not my shooting arm. Mm. Um, but, uh, so I've like had some like rotator cuff issues, which is different than what he's had. But I think a lot of people were like, well, he's definitely it fine. He's dribbling fine and everything else is fine. And it's just when he shoots, so clearly he's, like, just psyched out. I just don't think that's really how it works. Yeah. Like, I've had issues where it's, like, one very specific motion hurts and nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just me as not a professional athlete. Yeah. <laughs> 